great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hey everyone, it's Susan Linder, your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. I am on vacation and I am thrilled to be taking a break for the month of August. So what I've done is I've compiled my absolute favorite. Well, they're all my favorites, I guess. But these are my top four of the podcasts over the last year. And I know they're not just my favorites. They're also the four most listened to podcasts over the last year of shows. So I thought I'd rerun them um, during this month so you don't lose touch with all things great in innovation and hopefully inspire you with some of the incredible lessons that these breakthrough innovators had to share with me on the show. I look forward to seeing you back again right at the beginning of September so we can dive back into more of the Innovation Storyteller Show. Have a great summer. I am absolutely thrilled to have with me today Marty Curran and Anise Fadol from the innovation team at Corning, um, one of the longest standing American innovation companies and probably one of the top innovation firms in the world, bringing us innovations like Gorilla Glass, LED Glass, Safety Glass for automobiles, and pretty much any piece of glass that's touching your life in a technology device today is thanks to the innovative team at Corning. Um, It is my honor to work with this incredible team, and I would just love to introduce Marty, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you also came to Corning. Sure. I have a uh, finance undergrad with uh, Notre Dame and then got an MBA from uh, Virginia, came in up the classical finance track, but was asked to go into manufacturing where we were. We realized that prototyping was the lifeblood of our businesses, had a little success there, then asked to go into some uh, marketing and product line management where we jumped in and took a very interesting uh, optical connectivity uh, product line and ran with that. And then moved into uh, general manager of, of several businesses. So uh, in 2012, was asked, hey, "Can you come and we'll take a shot at creating an innovation office?" And uh, we we will explain a little bit about what exactly we do with that. But that's uh, how I got to where I am today. Over 30 years with uh, Corning. Wow! And how long have you been in this innovation role, Marty? What's your title Thanks. there? 2012, uh, it's uh, the Innovation Officer for Corning. Wow. Great. And joining you today is Anis Fadil, who is your partner in crime in all things innovation at Corning. Anis, would you mind introducing oh, so yourself? A varied, a varied history. <laughs> sure. Like Marty, I have over 30 years with Corning, uh, Director of Emerging Markets and Technologies. Under, under Marty's Emerging Innovations Group. We have been together for the, since 2012 when the innovation office, office started. Um, different than Marty, I have a mechanical engineering background or half of my career with Corning. I have been on the technical side of the house. And for the last 20 plus years, I have been either marketing, strategic planning, and new business development activities. I have been in pretty much every division of Corning over my career. Wow. So for younger listeners in um, in the innovation space, we might refer to you as lifers at, at Corning. <laughs> yeah. Does that sound about it, right? It, 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 it's increasingly, uh, you know, more and more we look at, are we dinosaurs? <laughs> uh, what's interesting to think of when, uh, when kids get told at school, you will have many, many people that you work for over your career. Uh, that is absolutely true. I think what's interesting is within Corning, uh, they we have that same experience, but with the same company. So we have these multitude of experiences in different functions and, and get that same feel, but you always end that back with the thread of the corporate group. 
That's what I right. find to be interesting. I, I categorize us as entrepreneurs as opposed to entrepreneurs. Yes, right. And I mean, that's a title that didn't even exist for us, right, 20 years ago. You wouldn't have known what an intrapreneur is. Um, when we think back to some of the original, um, the original innovators in, you know, the previous technological decade, we think about the Edisons of the world. I mean, Corning designed the glass for Edison's light bulb. I don't know that those folks would have referred to themselves as intrapreneurs at the time, um, but they were certainly setting the stage for what American entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship would look like for, you know, two centuries. Right. After. I think it's in the right way because the, the, the entrepreneur will pick their passion they tend to worry a lot about money and are out raising money all the time. And uh, they have to worry about cash. And if you think about the entrepreneur, which will have a lot of the same characteristics about resilience and tenacity and, and the ability to be curious, but usually the, the entrepreneur is picked for a project. We try to not to have them worry about cash. We want them to run their their uh, budget, you know, the, what they get for that and be thoughtful, but to focus on actually launching this particular innovation. Right. And so the tenaciousness that's required of an entrepreneur is the same as that of an entrepreneur, except you're fighting oftentimes legacy systems, right? So, um, and the way of the business as usual and the quarterly earnings that are your nemesis, as opposed to the venture capitalist who might not see the vision, right? You've got you've got several fronts that you're fighting on all the time. Can you tell us a little bit about the culture of innovation um, as you know it at Corning and how you've contributed to that culture of innovation? Right, I, I'll, I'll kick off and let uh, Nice do it. Uh, I think the, once again, we look at our history over 169 years is to invent you know, life-changing innovations, I think there's a lot of serendipity matched with very, very good science and engineering. I, I think that uh, growing things organically is our first choice, not that we won't do acquisitions, but the, the idea of taking this very, very robust science community and, and built layers and layers year after year uh, of innovation inside of Corning and then building on that. Many, many times, because uh, because more times than that will fail. And when you fail, you'll write up that experiment and you will put that uh, particular on the, on the shelf. And uh, you know something else will come up, uh, like, like Gorilla Glass, that will say, "Hey, you know, didn't we have Chemcore back in the '70s? And could you bring this forward to do that?" Um, in the case of Valor, our, our pharmaceutical uh, packaging invention, the the Borosilica that's used was Pyrex, invented by Corning in 1915. And then a century later, we figured it was time for 21st century glass for 21st century drugs. Denise, what do you think? No, I, I agree. Like, like you said, Marty, you know, we have 169 years, and over those 169 years, we have brought to market, you know, life changing innovations. So, as I mentioned, the uh, Edison light bulb which was like in the late 1800s, I think it was around 1879. And since then, we have bring, bring into market new innovations to the industry, uh, you know, silicons, uh, the TV, you know, the old CRT TVs, LCD TVs, as a catalytic converter for cars, optical fiber. You know, we have brought many, many innovations to market that we call life-changing innovations. Yeah. Right. I think it's great that we know we've been in the TV industry since the very beginning. It seems the very beginning, yeah. That's it's the it, black and white TV. Yeah, it's it's uh, well, like I said, some is serendipity, but it's fantastic. Yeah, and that I remember walking through Edison's workshop in South Orange, New Jersey, and watching that evolution of the light bulb come to be in this, you know, his workshop, and which has now become a national park and a museum that anyone can come and visit. And to see the Corning glass bulb that went over that, and I was just like, here is GE and Corning, two of my favorite clients coming together like, you know, peanut butter and chocolate over here. <laughs> like right. this. No, no polymers in that factory in his little invention shop. No polymer. Yeah. Incredible. Right. And so um, that 
ability for a 169-year-old company to continue to innovate uh, at the pace that you do and recognizing the shifts that happen in the market, especially in a global market, is fascinating because the ability to move quickly for a very old company is sometimes a huge challenge. And I'm curious if you can speak a little bit about that and how you think about it. And, and Marty, I recall one of our first conversations, you talked to me in a way that I had never, I had not heard chief innovation officers talk about this before, in that you saw innovation internally like a portfolio. And you broke down the different ways in which you thought about investing in innovation, much like I might hear a broker or a venture capitalist talking about their portfolio of innovation. Can you speak a little bit more to that and how you conceptualize how you invest in innovation internally? Right. Because we we would never tell you that. I think innovation at Corning at times is effective, but it's very rarely efficient. Mm -hmm. And what what we are trying to do is bring a, a rigor or, or, or a codification process so that when we hand off to the next generation, it won't be as hard as it has been for us because <laughs> it sure feels like the scars on our back are pretty deep. In the beginning, we said, okay, we, we'll take a shot at this. You know, you brought up the point, you know, is, is there politics? I think, I think the better way to think of it is the way our chairman Wendell Weeks thinks about it. The innovation process is a change management process. It's great thought leadership. He, and his point is that within the company, you have to lay out and put forward this idea and gain the support from the different groups that you need and to put the power of the entire organization behind it. And then at the customer, usually, we, you know, we're working on disruptions. You need somebody who has enough clout that A, recognizes the value of what you're bringing but is also able to shepherd this through their maze of obligations and everything. So that change management process has to work on both sides. Now, we looked at, initially we said, okay, let's do the innovation office, we'll do the tools, we'll do the portfolio. And I quickly realized I'm, I'm swamped just trying to manage the portfolio. We found a great process and tools guy in Jeff Ferner and he brought forward, I'm going to focus on what the tools and the templates and the things should be for these groups. So I went over and worked on it. Okay, where are the ideas coming from? And the ideas first would come off the line as you speak from research and development. It may be tied to our groups. It may not be. We try to organize things that if it's within the three research categories, and Anise could talk more about this later in the, the four manufacturing platforms or the five market access platforms. If it goes through two out of those three, it'll be a lower cost of innovation because we have great deep knowledge in those areas. Mm-hmm. If it does not, you know, then it needs to be an exception and it's got to be something rather large if we're going to do it because we won't, we won't have the same experience. So the first is research guys bring that and we try to categorize what do we have here. Second thing, a division, you know, a business in Corning may not have the bandwidth to take on the innovation. And so they'll come to the center and say, could you work on this for me? That's how uh, Valor started. The Life Science Group had their own business to run on a daily basis. And that's how Autoglass started. The Gorilla team had the idea that we should do this, but they're focused on what they needed to do in their market. And could you take this and, and try to lift it up? I would tell you that. And that's is, Gorilla Glass, right? Not Gorilla. Yeah, well, they're, using, they're using Gorilla <laughs> Glass in automobiles. And the mobile consumer access team, that's the proper name for that map, uh, that, that market access platform, they were focused on the mobile consumer industry. And they said, boy, if I have to do automotive, the automotive guys had their own large innovation they were working on, gas particulate filters. The mobile consumer access guys were worried about making sure that the next generation of Gorilla got out. So can you guys handle it? So the the balance you have to take, one is clearly if you try to launch something inside of a business, it's way more efficient. You have the people. You know who to do it. You got the pilot line. You know where to go. The bad thing is if you have a quarterly 
pressure on numbers. And I'm sure everybody on the podcast has unlimited money, but at least within Corning, we run into these problems where you have this pressure. And when you're managing that, the first thing that takes the hit is the large innovation, right? They, it's just, you're not able to do it. So we move it to the center to try to shelter it and incubate it and allow it to have time to grow. It is not the most efficient way, but it is the way to allow it to grow. Then the other place is when people knock on the door and say, can you help us? And in general, we'll take a look at that. Uh, Anise could talk about the, our, our little process crucible that we use to put these things through to say, should we work on it or not? Because what we're trying to do differently, I would say in the past, Susan, we did, you know, we would look at every, we'll, we'll still look at everything, but we'll very quickly make calls as to whether we're going to take time on this thing or not. Does it check off a few things for us that will go? The last thing that I always thought that I would have plenty of time to work on that I haven't gotten to is scouting. I thought I'd be able to, you know, kind of move around the world, meet lots of people, join lots of groups like this and spend time. I cannot. We, the first three areas from research, from division, from the people that knock on your door, we have uh, more things to work on than we could possibly do. And that last piece nickels at me a little bit because I feel like there's probably something out there we should work on and we're addressing it. I'm not going to talk about it here, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to talk about it. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have you back and you'll be able to tell us about yeah. it. No, no, no. Anise, what do you think? Talk about the Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Now, many companies, they struggle to find one single innovation to work on, right? And as you said, Marty, given our track record of success, the phone keeps ringing, right? People bring innovation to us. And so finding innovation to work on is not a problem that we have. That's why we have a prioritization tool. We have a list of many innovations that we're currently working on. And if one of them fails or we decide to stop and put on the shelf, the next one on the list will move up, right? And at one point, we have to draw the line. It's just how many resources we have available at a certain given time to work on it. If one of them dies, then the next one moves up. And it's yeah. still really hard to break through. Now, I don't, don't want to say that there's any magic in what it is. got to roll up your sleeves and grind, Susan. It really yeah. Is. You know, it, it leaves me kind of curious about this idea of moonshots. And, you know, where do you factor in a moonshot into your innovation portfolio? You know, what struck me the most about walking through Edison's workshop was those 10,000 attempts. And I wonder what Mr. Westinghouse <laughs> <laughs> walked over to him and tapped him on the shoulder and said, okay, we're on 7,861. Um, mm -hmm. When are we going to see the light of day on this thing? It's been God knows how long and God knows how many engineers and you're making everybody crazy. And really, how much light is this thing going to give off? And we know it didn't give off that much light, that first light bulb. But what happens at attempt number 700, you know, 7,681 when you know, your chairman comes over and says, what gives? What's up with this moonshot? Right. So you got, so we, we do have, man, I tell you the, the, I call it a roller coaster. Actually, Gardner has a great curve. We'll send you that curve because you should show it on your screen uh, uh, on this about the sort of the psychological times of a project. There's the beginning where the everybody believes it's going to be unbelievable. And then, you know, the beginning of the moonshot and then, there's the depths, the trough of disillusionment. And then, uh, you know, whether you come out of that or not is, is the answer. So the way we look at it, we got one particularly good uh, tool. Our teams had looked at, uh, you know, where, where do you fail? Everybody does critical assumptions in the beginning of a project. What they're not as rigorous on is keeping those assumptions in front of you such that if you are not solving those assumptions, then you either have to stop or solve it. It's got to be one or the other. And, and people, how, long, how long do you get for that? Uh, well, you should, in my opinion, and, and what, the way it works here, unless you have something like just happened, right? The COVID-19 causes you not to be as patient and causes you to make really, really hard choices. There are things that I would love to work on and continue to work on that aren't going to get worked on. So you can always look for partners. There's a number of other strategies to figure out how to keep things going. But in the end, there is a time when you have to make hard choices on the stuff that let me, let me say two things. 
you got to run for the big lie. There, there is a big lie. You and I talked about this when you're here. There's a big lie in every project, and you either have to solve it or stop. And once that lie is solved, that issue is solved, there's probably another one that's going to come up. And there's a tendency from folks, you know, not to, to give you a, an update and say, hey, look at all the greens I got. And I got this one red down here. But if that red's not solved, then you don't have a project. That's the first thing on that. And then we discovered that I, I am actually proud that we've uh, killed projects at a better rate uh, than we've had before. We, we've, we're taking more shots on goal and we're killing more. We actually, in October, every Halloween, this will be what, then it's the fourth annual? Yeah, fourth, fourth annual. Yeah. Dead projects. People were complaining that we weren't giving them recognition when they walked away from a project that uh, got killed. And so we try to take a time where we said, here's the projects we stopped, what we learned, and here's the people we want to thank. Keep it nice and light and, and uh, interesting. But in the end, when you look at, we, I think one of our problems is, or uh, for everybody, we tend to hang on too long, Susan, because we believe we can solve the problem. We've done it so many times. I mean, I've never seen a place where they schedule inventions. Oh, yeah. I'm going to hear at this milestone, I need an invention right here. That's just stunning to me that the technical teams can look at that. Can but, you imagine the, uh, the virus teams right now trying to come up with a, um, a vaccine and all of these pharma companies? The pressure must just be insane. But we had we had that with our own little guardian paint. You worked on this thing. You know, this right. what happened was he was working on an antimicrobial uh, substance that could be put into different um, materials. Paint was one of the first things. And then the, the virus happened and we had put that second. So he pivots and focuses on the antiviral claims. It's an incredible product for that. So we have three areas that we did, we did do a pivot. We allowed them to have a little bit of, of uh, room to run and we had to move other things down to do yeah. that. This is where the storytelling really starts, right? From that the time correct. you get that knock on the door and there's that innovation trigger, um, you know, from someone who says, okay, it's time. I've got this really cool idea. Can you help me? And, and by the way, it's like a roller coaster. It doesn't just go like this. We get, hey, we solved that problem. And I'm at the, I'm then the next problem and I'm, comes up. Next problem comes up and I'm back down in disillusion. What are you thinking? <laughs> these? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And then you go in front of customers, you show them the product, and they look at sometimes your product is ahead of its time, right? They will look at you and say, what planet are you from, right? You know, that innovation is crazy, right? It takes a little time for the product to be adopted. Optical fiber is a good example of that. It took us, what, 10 years, Marty, to get the first order well, even after we invented it? Or for the cash flow, it was 17 years, and I think uh, display was 14 14, 12, 14 years. Say that again, just, just so the other folks on the call can hear this. How long did it take you to get the cash for Gorilla Glass? And to be clear, tell our audience exactly where they will find Gorilla Glass currently in their pocket. All right, Anise, that's you, buddy. Go ahead and <laughs> okay, yeah, Gorilla Glass today is the uh, standard product. It's a cover glass for pretty much every cell phone in the market today. And uh, soon your are automobile. <laughs> yeah, and soon automobile. We are in o over eight billion uh, devices, you know, for mobile consumer electronics. That one, the story was a slightly different because we do we didn't have a crystallizing customer at the end that was desperate looking for that product. That one took us ninety days to bring it to market. So, they, wow. so they, 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 this was a similar actually to CT. You know, Wendell visited Steve Jobs. He was looking for. Wendell wanted to teach uh, Steve. He said, Look, this is a good idea about a projector. We had a green laser at the time that a we're going to use the phone to project on the wall. I love that idea. I love that product. And uh, he said, that's the stupidest idea I'd ever heard. So Wendell's idea was really of all time. But when it, when it, then it came to pass that he, he really wanted to do it all on the phone. And he really needed something other than that. And Wendell was able to go into the libraries of what we had. and then. Turn something around in you know record time. By the way, we love inventions like that. We love innovations like that. The spend from the time that the customer needs to you get to you launch is amazing. 
the, the ones that are more difficult are when you invent something and then you have to go out to the market and explain, I have something that's an incredible disruption. Can I help you with this? That's a, a nuance that, you know, people in listening, if you can find the customer who needs help and will use your product to solve their problem, boy, do you want to jump on that? That is a, that is a rarer bird than you will find a great idea and now you want to take it out to the customer to sell it. Yeah, I mentor a lot of startups, 20 years now of, uh, of being a mentor to different startup accelerators and incubators in universities all over the world. And I always tell those entrepreneurs to fall in love with the problem, not the product that you've built, not the that, solution that you've built. That's right on. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and that, that understanding is a shift that says, I'm not going to fall in love with my, with my baby, right? It, my yeah. desire has always got to be closer to, to the problem. And I, I think sometimes where innovation runs into a problem is that we get too far away from the customer, actually. I think you're right. But, you know, back to your moonshots idea, man, my sort of rule of thumb is it seems to take seven or eight years for the big, big ideas to really work their way through and to really gain those pieces. The, the payoff is great. But my goodness, the, the Gorilla Glass idea happened. But remember, there was a failed idea earlier. When you look at fiber and LCD, when they were birthing something into the market, look how long those took, right? That was, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. You know, and Anise, I'm kind of curious your perspective, and this might be a little esoteric, but, you know, when you hear storied names like, <laughs> like Wendell Wilkie and Steve Jobs just having a conversation about random new products they might be able to build together, like this is the stuff that makes innovators salivate, right? But when you think about innovation, you know, and I think about Napoleon Hill, you know, he classified two kinds of innovation. There is synthetic and there is natural innovation. Um, and that's how our imagination works. Steve Jobs believed that, you know, it is the ability to connect ideas together that other people don't see, that the connecting of dots is what creates innovation. And then Napoleon Hill said, there's this other kind of innovation that we almost channel when our thoughts are so aligned that we have clarity of what is needed, but we have no idea how to get there. There's this other kind of almost, I hate to say it, but almost divine inspiration for that innovation. That's something that springs forth seemingly out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you've experienced both of those or if if this is a far more practical thing that happens within a corporation. You just described a regular day in our lives, right? <laughs> we see that every day. Constant <clears throat> contact with universal, yeah. universal intelligence that yeah. brings mm -hmm. us these ideas. Yeah. Because Absolutely. I think when you're in the flow, right? I mean, when, when you have engineers and chemists who are at the bench, who are just doing their thing, sometimes something striking happens that isn't predictable, isn't just a connecting of dots. Something really unique emerges. I'm, I'm curious, and, and he's like, do you see that? Yeah, yes, we do see that all the time. And often we see one innovation in one area that we think it's perfect for a application and then someone comes, you know what, that is much better off to do this rather than your what you originally thought. A lot of our products came to market that way. Pyrex is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. We have many other stories that it, the product was invented for one application, and the biggest application was something completely different that we never thought of. And then you go and look at you know what they just did, and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? There's nothing worse than somebody who's just invented something that's the only uh, thing of its kind on the planet and you can't figure out what to do with it. Uh, that, that just steers me to my soul when we're trying to figure that out. I, I, I always feel like I've let down the inventors on those types of products. There are still a bunch of those inside a corner that we're trying to still figure out what's the right place to use these things because they're so unique. Right. And that's got to be so frustrating. Because oh, I think that in, that in my job, that is the number one frustrating. This, the second most frustrating is something that should work and is blocked by what well, you, you call it politics, but the change management because people just don't recognize the value. Oh. It, it, 
it is beyond the pale. It usually happens later on, but it is the most frustrating thing you can imagine. That's why storytelling, you know, Susan, is, is so very important. Let's talk about that for a minute because there is nothing worse. And I, I can't Im- imagine even the letdown to the teams, right, who have poured their heart and soul and blood and sweat into getting that innovation almost to the finish line, only to hear, sorry, yeah, we're not going to move forward with that. So mm-hmm. can you give us a little bit of insight on how the sausage is made and you know what it's like to influence different teams to get on board, to say to the chairman, we need more budget, we need more time, we need more recognition internally to move this forward so we get the resources in the runway that we need. Talk to us a little bit about what that's like and really, if you want to, tell us where it's it's failed, like maybe even where the story's failed or the product has failed and we just couldn't get it there. I'll kick it off, and then Anise, you come in. You can probably think of something. that is your specialty, Marty. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my specialty is a failure. <laughs> oh my goodness! But they the uh, so there's there's two areas of failure. One area is when you find the big line, it stops, and I'll give you an example. The other is uh, when the idea, even though it looks so logical, just doesn't take off. There, there's something that you're not catching. And it, it is beyond, you know, why don't people understand? So I'll give you my two examples of that. One, we have we have this cool glass that changes when uh, sunlight comes called photochromic glass. They actually used it in uh, eyeglasses years ago. You may remember Corning had supplied glass to uh, people that when you went out in the sun, then it would turn into a shades. And when you came back in, it would it would turn into your regular glasses. Right. Mm-hmm. So we had a great idea. Why don't we take this? It was one of our exploratory guys, and in, in, uh, he's retired now, but he was he's a great thinker, Paul Penn. He said, why don't we take one of those? Everybody's looking for switchable windows. The current technologies of which we dabble in are rather expensive. Wouldn't it be great if you just had a glass and the glass changed on its own? It's not going to be as good. It, most of what Corning does is not in the Clayton Christensen classic disruption where it is just good enough and it's below. We usually have areas that are uh, higher cost, but they lower the overall system. So it's a harder sell to folks and you end up getting the target on your back. But this would have been one of those classic Christians and disruptions because it's it would cost a little more than regular glass, but it would change on its own. And the only problem that it had was depending on the temperature, if it got too hot when you want it to turn dark, temperature wise now the glass it would it would lighten up and when it got too cold when you want the the glass to be light it would start to darken up and we didn't we didn't figure that out we thought hey we're going to put it on the inside and on the inside of these double pane windows we're cool and they had done a few tests but the the uh the we this didn't last that long but it probably lasted longer than it should this we're talking months now the fact of the matter is even in a double pane that temperature will hit that glass in the same way as the outside. Not quite, this, not exactly, but it doesn't protect it by that much. So we ran into that problem where it wasn't being switchable the way it should be. So that was a case of you found the big lie to your invention, put it back on the shelf, and we'll see when we use it again. I still love that product. We use it to teach folks on, on yeah. thinking about all the areas. Now, the, the other one that I love is... You know, we first went after Gorilla Glass, back to the ChemCor idea. Uh, let's go back into automobiles. And we, we actually have an invention of you take a, 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 a mo- most of your windshields are a laminate, two glasses. Well, you can take a, a soda lime outside glass and put a very, very thin Gorilla Glass on the inside. And your window will not break anywhere near the way that it does today. And I mean, I, and, and by the way, a little more expensive, I think on a regular windshield, it would cost you 25 to 35 bucks. Yeah, more. Sure. But if you knew, Susan, that I don't know how many uh, windshields you've had to replace in your lifetime. If you knew that, hey, I'm protected from this thing, that would be great. I want to tell you, we're in probably 20, 22 models, and we've done more inventions where I think this will still be a rather large business. 
However, the supply chain resisted it because they all wanted to be able to do it. It's a very, very old supply chain with very thin margins. So introducing innovations that have that kind of cost difference, uh, the non-Clayton Christensen innovation, that went against their, their model. The second thing is, I thought, hey, the first place we'll go is we'll go to a replacement plant. Well, you know, you're taking away people's business. I said, well, you could change the business model and let's do some innovation. And uh, recently, Jeep has figured out this is fantastic. And they use Gorilla for their programs in Jeep for replacement glass, and they love it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I look at that and think, man, why isn't everybody using this? Why can't I go down and get this put on all the cars? And what's going on? That's a classic case of people just either we clearly don't understand or or uh, there are people resisting what I think is a great innovation. Yeah, I remember helping Kevin, right, from Autoglass ah, with yeah, the issue. And also even the weight of the window shifted, right? And suddenly- oh, 30% lighter. It's, it's lighter, stronger, and, and has better optics. It, that's what you want a windshield to be, right? You want it to Sounds be- horrible. Tougher. Right. <laughs> Lighter and, and better optics. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so pushing that through. So you have supply chain issues, obviously, that you have to deal with. But there's also those internal battles, you know, that say, you know, we've got six different windshields that we're thinking about for this year. How are we even prioritizing how this works? And then um, the story that that takes us through that path when we need to overcome that resistance. It's not always a dollars and cents conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm true. curious, what are the other factors? And then these, maybe as you even pull back and think about this on a global scale, right? Because I mean, getting this adoption around the world isn't just U.S. manufacturers, right? Every supply chain is global now. Yeah, they, I'm going to give you two of them, Denise. You, you can't mention their name, but you might talk about your Willow customer. Because that's a great story without using the name. But just mm -hmm. two quick. One is, uh, I, I probably ought to let Anise go first, but I'll say this. You're always better off, Susan, picking the disruptor. You know, we call it a crystallizing customer. People want that. that people used to try things out on little customers. That's not going to help you uh, run through the market. We say pick a crystallizing customer who's a disruptor who will then set the tone for everybody. I think people go for large market share people who are not, are not necessarily disruptors. They're more likely to be uh, conservative in bringing something forward. So that that would be one thing. Uh, Anise, I'll kick it over to you. Uh, I was going to say, never under, underestimate the incumbents in the supply chain, right? They will do everything they can to block your innovation. Mm. Never un underestimate your competitors because, again, they're going to make everything they can to hold their position, right? Uh, so never un underestimate those two. If you work with a disruptor, right, it may not be the largest player in the whole channel, but they are uh, hungry, right, for success. And they are nimble. They want to move faster. And often in times that helps. And, and they probably of, have bigger margins too, right? I mean, so I, I, I'm not revealing anything because I don't know what you're referring to, but immediately as you speak, I think about Tesla, right? In this supply chain that says, I have an incredible market cap, right? So I have a lot mm -hmm. of cash I can play with. Um, number two, I'm already known as a disruptor. I need to be crazy and out there in order to try something new that will force others to follow, that will shift the supply chain. When I think about a company like that, um, I know I was in your offices when they were debuting their pickup truck and Elon <laughs> Musk throws a metal ball at the window and you watch it break. You're like, oh no, whose glass was that? I uh, probably should have had our help on that one. But, uh, oh, yeah. Corning himself, 169 years might be able to teach you something about throwing a metal snowball at a window. That's right. Right, we got many guys, phone calls that day. <laughs> here's, here's what I would add to it. You, you want the customer to be investing. Mm -hmm. If your customer is, that you're talking to, whether they be a supply chain partner or the end customer, if they're not investing, then they, if they're not likely to be serious. You know that somebody like Elon is investing. He's putting his, his, his ideas out there and then going for it. I think that's really important. And then I like to, I worry always about, you know, Corning, 
there isn't many people in the S and P 500 that are there from the beginning like we are. And what did you say in these 20 to 25? 25 usually, yeah, on average, 25 companies every year will drop from. So this. if you yeah. believe something, you know, capitalism is going to uh, eat, eat their young and and to reinvent. If you're not thinking that way for your own product, then you know you're going to be that incumbent that that Anise talks about. So it, the idea should be that we bring forward these things and we're totally willing to disrupt our own supply chains to make these things happen. Well, can we discuss that for one second? Because sometimes you are replacing a very profitable business line with a new innovation. In my book, Innovation Storytelling, I talk about you know this shift from kind of like a you know, seven minute abs to six minute abs, right? I mean, we're always trying to iterate and find a better um, and find a better outcome. But how do you suddenly say, I'm going to cannibalize a huge profit maker for the business by introducing something new, not knowing if the market will even adopt it? And frankly, what's the pressure internally from that team that says, I want to hold on to this. This is my little kingdom that I've built. It's perfect. It's a huge money generator. Why would I change it? Is that even a culture that exists in Corning that says, hold on? Uh, by the way, I'm very simple on this because I'll leave the, the high thinking to our research scientists. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Somebody will do it. Yeah. Mm. So That's right. He's going to cannibalize. We rather cannibalize ourselves rather than someone else coming in and cannibalizing. Why wouldn't you do that, right? Beautiful. And, uh, you remember the famous story of IBM with the 286, and they had the 386 ready to go, and they chose to, to milk the product just a little longer and compact, jumped out in front. I never forgot that lesson after reading that thing. And luckily, we have a lot of people that, you know, there there is a Wall Street uh, component that will say that is inefficient investment, right, Susan? You're laughing, but... You know this. You guys already have a great investment. I'm a PE guy. I'm going to ride that thing until it's gone. Mm -hmm. and you don't renew and you know that something could change. There's, there's a way to do that. And to move. So, so what's I, the story? What's the story? Is that always been the culture at Corning that we cannibalize ourselves before someone will do it to us. Is, is that the culture internally? Has it always been that way? Or do you still meet that resistance? Um, as long as I've been in here, the, at least the people that I've been blessed to work with has always been that way. Maybe that comes from the chairman on down, but man, what do you think, these? Yeah, I agree. You know, a good example of that is TVs, right? You know, we have been in the TV business since day one, right? We saw the trends that the, the big bulky TVs were going to die someday. So we did invest heavily on flat screen TVs or glass or flat screen TVs. And to a point that we divested the CRT TV business to pump that money into flat screens. One of my favorite things, Susan, was I got assigned to go to the optical fiber division, right, and, and uh, run that. And, you know, one of the worst jobs you can ever have is be a GM where the chairman has been a GM of a business in his past because it is just difficult. But what I loved was, these guys wanted to reinvent a very successful product that had been there for 40 years. And doggone it, didn't they go and do it? And they, they basically, you know, reached, they changed every part of it. I can't tell you how difficult it is on a very, very successful, you know, plant and everything. And, and, and this is an around the world thing to be able to do that and keep the, the, but, but by doing that, and that's, almost a decade ago now, these guys have kept their leadership position in a product. You know, it, it's, I, I see product life cycles shrinking, but then I look at some of the corning product life cycles and they go, you know, almost 50 years. If you're not reinventing and changing during that time frame, you're just not going to keep that franchise. So how do you think? the diversity of ideas going? I mean, you guys have been in these positions, right? For a long time, you've seen a lot of ideas come and go. Is there a way that you keep it fresh and exciting even for yourselves? Or do you just find that innovation coming from R&D and coming from within the businesses that you don't have to look that hard to find new innovation these days? 
you know, as I said before, the phone keeps ringing every day with new innovations. I think just in the last three or four weeks, there were like six big new innovations that came in as a phone call, right? And our research scientists, they are, you know, they have this passion for finding new things, right? It's unique where we work here in our Sullivan Park Research and Development Facility. You have been here, Susan. We have like about 2,600 people working here, and that's what they do day in, day out, right? They look for new ideas, new innovations, and on the development of those. It's a very unique uh, work environment. Give you two more pieces. In the, the, uh, the One is about 80% of the spend is aligned with the businesses. Yep. So when, when the businesses will say, I'm, I want to, I'm looking for an invention here. I want to do something here. And then the research guys are lined up. The other 20 is left for, at the discretion of the CTO to do his work. The second thing is with the balance that um, you must not forget for those GMs that are listening to their innovation guys come in is that um, don't get so out of balance on new products. Uh, remember the transformative cost reduction projects. Um, remember the business model innovations. It takes a lot of work to do uh, transformative cost reductions. Uh, it's an innovation that people don't see. Uh, you know, people love to see a new product that they can go point to and do that. But, you know, the fact that you've taken a new product and you put it into a cost area that now it can be used around the world, maybe maybe they don't feel the same about that. And you have to keep that balance, I think, on that. Yeah. You know, there's, a, there's a consulting group out of Sweden called Innovation 360, and they did an analysis of what are the most impactful innovations that take place within large corporations. And it was business model shift that actually wound up changing things. So like, you know, our universe now is almost like a subscription model based, right? The things that we purchase for ourselves. Um, who would have thought that the newspaper model of buying things on a monthly basis, right? Right. How we consume our entertainment or our media or what have you, that shift has changed everything about how we sell software to how we sell shoes even, right? I mean, people get shoes once a month delivered to their house <laughs> or detergent or diapers or anything else. So I, I think it's so wise that you share that is um, everybody wants the shiny new thing, right? We all want the new iPhone. Yeah, and right. yet the impact like is, is often the business model shift or the process shift that changes things. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that's true. I think that's very true. Tell us a little bit, you know, so you've had a storied career at Corning. What is your proudest moment from your innovation career? Anise, what, what comes to mind for you? For me, it was bringing a product to market, uh, a product called Ego XG Glass. It's probably our largest and most profitable product line ever in the history of the company. Wow. That's the glass that goes into your flat screen TVs. I was you know, lucky that I did the value proposition and the introduction to that product to the market back in the year 2000. So if you have a television in your home, you have Anise and his innovation team. Right? Absolutely. If you have a television in your house, there's a very high probability that you have that product in your house. And how does that feel? Great, right? Yeah. It is, mm-hmm. It's pretty amazing. What about it you? I, I, I have uh, three sort of separate areas. One was the first time we have, we have a little uh, field installable connector that is uh, still used in the industry. And it was the, the working and working and working on that. Uh, we, we call it first you break through and then you break out. And it had broken through, but it had all kinds of issues. And we, we worked so hard on making that repeatable and teaching installers and getting the marketing out because the average user uses maybe a hundred connectors a year. So you're not gonna, you know, you have to have a whole base around the world that is pulling your product. And watching that and how it worked, that was that was from a a in my PLM days helping that. And we the first PLM that did all the grunt work on that it was a, a a lady that I worked with. It was I can't tell you the amount of missionary time you have to spend to tell the story. She was really great at storytelling. Second was the fiber to the home, uh, Corny. Different people have been talking about fiber to the home since 1978. 
and uh, it was always just around the corner. And in 2004, Verizon actually stood up and said, I'm going to build a fiber optic system. If you, uh, they, they call it Fios, right? That's the, that's where that term comes from. And if you looked at what they were trying to do, it made all the sense in the world. And we helped them with that and launched. That was uh, one where when we heard, it was after having uh, tough times. And uh, we may have had, uh, I think I had 220 engineers. And I asked the guy, could you do a student body right to help? And he came in and he says, well, I think, you know, we've got 35 people that can work on this. I said, I don't think you understand my concept of student body right. In the end, I think 180 of the 220 engineers touched that project to make that in. We launched that uh, with those guys and uh, it did everything we thought it would do. And then the last two, there, I can't say that it was efficient and uh, it's taken way longer, but it was definitely a, it seems like the market needs this. Uh, Valor, uh, we kicked off a while ago and they've had the traction. That's had all the classic obstacles that an innovation has to take, but it's a moonshot and it appears to be uh, coming to pass. And then what the is other Valor, for those who don't know. Yeah, for Valor, it's a pharmaceutical glass uh, that was invented, a 21st century glass for 21st century drugs. And uh, it, it, the idea is to uh, reduce and eliminate the breakage and uh, any kind of uh, delamination that happens inside of that glass and make that the drug perfect, uh, a perfect container for that drug. And these guys had to invent, uh, we started off, we were just going to help the supply chain. And they instead went in rigorously and deeply reinvented how, how you make that glass. And, you know, you find things along the way. One of the processes to making that tubing was invented by Corning in like 1930, some crazy year like that. And so we're back visiting processes that had not been touched for, you know, almost a, a century. And so those guys have done that work and it, it's still a lift, but uh, I've been very proud of watching them and how they did that. The other one is this auto glass. Um, usually the hard part is the front end, you know, explaining to people what we have and how to do that. And then you count on your development and your, and your manufacturing guys that, to you know, get that rocking and rolling. Uh, they've had the opposite effect. The front end has gone very well. The back end, had a little had a little trouble because they had this little thing called a pandemic that showed up in the middle of everything and caused them a couple ruins of everything. It kills every party. It kills every pandemic. Just, <laughs> it just takes time. I had another one that I won't mention that I put uh, significant resources in. It was a moonshot and it failed. We had to call the ball on that one. Uh, we'll put it on the shelf. We have a little small that will benefit from that. Uh, but it was one that uh, we took a big, big swing at. So I would say in this category, the in the third category, the innovation officer, those were three things that uh, we took a look at. We got a bunch of little ones. And yeah. Denise is, is uh, fantastic at another one. He'll show up in your office. Hey, by the way, listen to this. And, and <laughs> it'll turn out to be something very, very interesting to the point where, right, Denise, we had to call it a new category. We were trying to measure wins and losses, there's a new category. There's wins, losses, and then there's small wins. So if you were aiming for a moonshot, Susan, and this actually happened, I won't mention the product, and you do not succeed, but it turns out to be a $25 million product with very nice margins, and you spent perhaps five to $8 million launching it, you'd have to call that a success. They've been consistently doing it. So we call that a little win. So there's, there's wins, losses, and then the little wins. There's well, no then you should have a portfolio of little wins, right? You know, yeah. There's we're not, happy there's with that. Little, they're all losses, all hurt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm seeing more and more um, uh, innovation teams that are putting out annual reports with their wins, failures, and like you said, the little wins. And uh, those incremental ones are like that 1930s development, right, that comes back 100 years later to say, still here. Still yeah. waiting for you to figure me out. Yeah. I was here all along. By the way, you know, it's time to go back to the archives and see what's yeah. there. And, and by the way, while we won't take that public, I encourage every one of your innovation officers out there to go back, look at your things, do all the do all of the metrics. You know, are you killing things faster? 
What is your hit rate? Are you doing more shots on goal? How, how does all those work? Because those metrics over time actually do matter. Well, Marty, Anise, thank you so much for taking the time today. I know that the innovators and the storytellers who are on the call on the podcast today listening to you have learned so much. I don't know if there's a final thought that you want to leave uh, your fellow innovators and fellow storytellers with maybe some words of encouragement or don't do what I did or <laughs> whatever you'd like to leave them with. Thank you for inviting us. Innovation is not easy, right? You have to be resilient. Uh, you've got to be able to take a few bullets, dust them off and move on, right? Mm -hmm. That's I'll right. I'll give you a couple of ones that we pulled out that I like, uh, Susan. Uh, one is that it's got to be personal. Uh, even if you're, if you want to be a real in entrepreneur, then you got to own that. That is the part that you own like an entrepreneur. You must own this project with all your heart and soul, but mm -hmm. you can't make it personal. You got to be able to look and say, you know what? This isn't working. I'm going to call the ball on this. Such a hard thing to do. The other thing is, uh, I, I think we all want to listen to customers, but then you have to make up your own mind. Uh, because the customer doesn't always know what they want. And so that that balance of um, this is what they're telling me, what am I going to deliver? That's a story for another time about, about you know, the successes and failures of that. And then, uh, you know, I would say that you want to own the project, but boy, it, it is a team effort and it won't succeed unless the team is all there. So that part about making sure that uh, folks are recognized for what they do is really, really important. Mm. And thank you, Sandra. We'll try to be a little more organized next time. That recognition of the innovation, right, and the team that brought it to bear. There's very rarely uh, one figure. We like to think about the Steve Jobs, right, as the sole pillar who moved innovation forward. But we know where Steve would be, you know, without Waz. And um, not to mention an anonymous team of entrepreneurs who made that, uh, entrepreneurs rather, and innovators who, who brought it to life. So I can't thank you enough for giving us, you know, 169 years of innovation tradition at Corning and letting us learn from all of that with you. Thank you so much. And um, I'll make sure to include all the links as well as that Gartner hype cycle so you can figure out how to tell the story even through those troughs of disbelief and disenchantment and disillusionment because we've all been there and we all got to get through it. Thank you so much, Marty and Denise. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.